fine people, Esther here. Wanting to talk today about two card spreads. Um, this month, I'm filming this in June 2022, the Mindful Tarot community, we're doing a challenge called hashtag spread June. We're thinking about spreads throughout the month. And uh, each week, we're focusing on a different number to determine what kind of spread to do that week. So week one, we were doing one card spreads. Week two, this is the second week of June, we're doing two card spreads. Next week, we'll do three card spreads, three card spreads and so forth. And so today I wanna to share with you a couple of things I wanna share with you. First of all, a two card spread that I'm calling the Papus spread. And then as I'm showing that spread off, I wanna to talk to you about two different ways to actually pull the cards, both of which are kind of relevant to what the Papist spread is for me. But before I dive into that, I wanna introduce you to this, <laughs> this angle on my shrine room slash meditation space slash uh, tarot studio. Um, this is where all of the SD magic happens pretty much. It's um, my, little, my little sanctuary. And you're used to seeing it mostly from uh, about 180 degree uh, different view. That way is my main Buddha altar. And so now we're seeing what's kind of behind that offer, uh, behind that that altar, behind that view. Um, and these are where all of my female icons, I, I mean, I didn't plan it this way, but it's sort of how it works out that typically I'm kind of facing toward my main Buddha, but then behind me, backing me up are all the ladies. <laughs> so uh, over my shoulder, you'll see Gaia. Um, I actually, I am not, sorry cut my finger earlier. <laughs> You'll see my band-aid and my bloody stump. Um, I actually won that guy uh, image at uh, the Northwest Tarot Symposium back in um, 2017, I think it was. I never win anything, but I won a raffle and she was what I won. So that's pretty fabulous. Right over there, er, 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 there we go, is uh, my one of my Quan Yin figures. That was actually my, my mother's father. Um, traveled to um, uh, Buddhist to travel to Asia and collected sort of Buddhist -y artifacts. Although he was not a Buddhist at all, he was he was Jewish, but really he was an atheist. Um, and he wasn't necessarily the nicest person in the world, but he had really beautiful taste. <laughs> he had great taste, so um, he picked up that one. And uh, she's all cracked and has been repaired, but she's really really precious to me. Um, over my shoulder over there is, you can see the sort of ivory, that's a smaller ivory uh, Kuan Yin, which my grandfather also got from, I think from Japan. And next to her is a sort of metal, um, a, a larger metal figure, Kuan Yin. Um, I think the, the image that in some ways is the most powerful for me in the room is her, her. pardon my pointing, that's Black Tara and um, yeah, she's quite she's quite a force. I, I feel her. <laughs> so those are my ladies, <laughs> my ladies. Those are my uh, my female archetypes, um, and they're appropriate for us to have in view today because I want to talk about this uh, new two card spread of mine, the Papist spread. Um, so here's the thing, you know, as I talk about spreads, and this is what I've been stressing in my videos so far is. You know, every time we do a tarot spread, we're always pulling a certain number of cards, you know, two card spread, three card spread, four card spread, whatever it is. There's a number of cards that we are pulling in that spread, a 10 card spread, the Celtic cross, right? Whatever it is. Tarot teaches us quite precisely about number. And when we're doing our spreads, that, uh, that teaching about number should inform how we think about our spreads. So the tarot teaches us about number in uh, at least two, maybe three ways, depending on how we how we enumerate things. The first way in which tarot teaches us, teaches us about number has to do with the way in which, particularly in the major arcana with its uh, long iconographic history going back to the early modern period, to the original tarot decks, the major arcana, the trump cards, have built into them certain kinds of geometric abstract relationships among the various component parts of the image. So I'm thinking here, for instance, uh, about the way that, you know, uh, a card like, let's say, mm, oh, I had this card pulled earlier. Here we go, the Hierophant. 
Even though this card is literally the number five in the Major Arcana, this card is teaching us very much about the number three through its iconography, right? Through the ways in which this card shows us how um, that, sh that triangular shape of three, of the three points, articulates a kind of resolution of duality at a higher level. Right, we see that in the chariot, the way the charioteer who's managing the two sphinxes or horses is resolving the tension between the two lower points at a higher level. The number three in tarot, as it's pictorially represented in the classic imagery, especially of the major arcana, teaches us about number and number as spatial relationship and spatial meaning. And what's particularly interesting in the major arcana when we have Roman numerals, as we do going back uh, to the, the earliest complete tarot deck that has survived, the Solabusco, where the, the major arcana, the trump cards, all have Roman numerals at the top. What's interesting is that uh, the relationship of these three points of this triangular kind of uh, system that is carried in the number three, right, that also relates to the Roman numeral five in its kind of pointedness, its triangularity, right? So the ways in which fives in tarot often mean turning points or power, moments of power, or even moments of oppression, like in the devil, which is the 15th, the 10 plus five card of the major arcana, we see that as a kind of triangular relationship where, where power, the pinnacle, the V of the five, that pinnacle point is uh, a place of power. And that triangular shape is represented in, in uh, especially in Pamela Coleman Smith's art with the braces on the acolytes. We start to think, oh, threes, like the, the papal cross and the, the way in which the Trinity works in, in sort of Catholic iconography or Christian imagery. Yeah, this is all about hierarchy and power, right? So in its imagery, particularly in its most classical representations, going back to the early modern period, the tarot teaches us about number through shape, through image, right? Through iconography. It also teaches us about number through the numbering of cards. So I was just talking now about how the fifth card in uh, any of the tarot suits, right, whether it's the major arcana or the minor arcana, the fifth card seems to have a kind of pivotal, uh, a pivotal turning point uh, feel to it. And this kind of sense of fives as being turning points, as being pivot points, um, and whenever I use the word pivot, I hear that V, <laughs> that that V at the center of the word, the English word pivot, the V that goes with the Roman numeral five. This is thinking about fives that's embedded in the structure of the tarot because these are numbered cards and it harkens back to some of the earliest uh, human philosophizing about number. It harkens back to pretty ancient numerological traditions. So those are at least two ways that the tarot teaches us about number. It also teaches us about number in the associations that we make with particular cards. So here's where the papist comes up or the high priestess, which is the number two so the papist, right? The high priestess. She is the second card, the second numbered card in the major arcana. And she is all about whatever it means to go behind the veil, whatever it means to sit atop the mysterious depths. So my papist spread, which is a two card spread, like the two of this card, like the two pillars depicted in this card, is a spread that's all about the relationship between what is implicit and what is explicit, between what is uh, front and center and visible to us and what is invisible, what is hidden, what is in the depths, what is in the watery deeps, what is behind the veil, what is uh, in shadow, not because it is repressed, but because it is the mystery. So the papist spread is a two-card spread 
where what we are investigating is the relationship between what I can see right out front, what's explicit, and what underlies it in the hidden depths, where I can see the manifest and the mysterious. That might be the best way to say it, the manifest and the mystery, okay? So, two card spread, what's above the deeps, what's below the deeps, what's manifest, what's in mystery. I'm going to pull the a papist spread now. I'm going to pull it tw uh, twice, <laughs> which is actually kind of perfect, right, to pull this spread twice, given that it's a uh, spread that's all about that doubleness, that otherness that's carried in the number two, that's carried in the figure of the papists. I'm going to be using uh, M.J. Coulinane's Crow Tarot, the, uh, the indie edition of that deck, which I quite love. And the first way I'm going to pull this is I'm going to shuffle, I'm going to shuffle deeply. I'm going to shuffle well. And in keeping with this sense of this spread as being what's manifest above and what's, uh, what's the mystery below, what's above, what's below, what's in front of the veil, what's behind the veil. Um, the first card I'm going to pick, which is what's manifest, is going to be what's on top of my deck. Okay? What's above. So there are a lot of ways that we can choose our cards in a spread. We can create piles. We can just shuffle and draw. We can uh, make a mess on the table and pick what's closest to us, right? We can see if there are jumpers and choose those. Um, there are a lot of ways that we can pick our cards. Um, this is a way that I really like, particularly when I'm trying to think about what's uh, manifest and what's hidden, what's obvious and what's perhaps less less explicit. And what I like about this is this particular way of choosing my cards, of drawing my cards, is because I tend to always feel, I just had some jumpers there, but I'm going to put them back in the deck. Um, I'm putting them back in. I tend to always feel like when I pick a card from the top of a deck, I tend to always really find myself wondering what's underneath. And in fact, that urgency, that or that impulse to mm, find out what's underneath, to look under the stone, to wonder about what's slightly hidden from view, to turn things over, that impulse, which I think is such a powerful impulse in any kind of spiritual practice, um, to look underneath, or any kind of... Uh, actually any kind of educative practice, any kind of exploratory practice, to look underneath that impulse, that's really the impulse that the papist or the high priestess represents. Let's look underneath. Let's encounter what can't be seen. Which, of course, by definition, we can't really encounter what can't be seen. But we can put ourselves... Uh, mm, we can put ourselves forward to meet that which remains and must remain a mystery. Okay, one last shuffle. Okay. So, what's manifest? Okay, the King of Cups. Now, that was the top card. So what's underneath? What's mystery? Wow. Wow. The Five of Cups. Well, interesting that they're both cups, right? Um, in Maggie Steve Fodder's Raven's Prophecy deck, uh, cups are represented by the crows, by the ravens. And, and I always, you know, I always think about cups as sort of the corvid, <laughs> the corvid uh, suit, like they are the raven suit itself. So here I have crows, and I never quite remember what the difference is between a crow and a raven. Um, but uh, yeah, two cups. So the king of cups and the five of cups. How does that speak to this moment? So what comes forward for me at this time in my life is trying to put myself forward 
as leader to find my leadership in the world of spirit and emotion, uh, both as chaplain and as Zen teacher, and then also as tarot, tarot, whatever I am, tarot person, um, putting myself forward as leader in that, in that register, finding my, my full voice, finding my, uh, finding my seat, taking my teacher's seat, right? The King of Cups. And this is what's the mystery underneath that, the depths, the watery, murky, full of, full of, so full of light that they are, that it is just darkness. What's underneath, it's like black, black Terra. The, the, the black Terra, hidden Tara, uh, hidden, hidden depth of this is loss, grief. I keep coming back to grief these days, don't I? But it's the five of cups. It's what has been spilled, which I carry with me. The, the loss, the grief, the grief that is not just my personal grief, folks. This isn't just about little old Esty. Um, but the, the deep, deep grief of, of, of a human life, of being human. That achy, breaky heart of ours. Okay, so that's my papist spread right now, which is a kind of, I think, invitation to uh, picture the teaching seat of the King of Cups in relationship to grief and loss. Now, I'm going to uh, put these back. I'm going to put the, them back right where they were. I'm going to shuffle again. And I'm going to do a different kind of draw just to demonstrate it. And it's equally, I think, an equally uh, appropriate way to draw for a papist or high priestess spread, a spread that's all about what's manifest and what's mystery, what's above and what's below. Uh, what's in the light and what's in the dark, what, what, is, what is visible and obvious and known and what is hidden and secretive perhaps, or at least elusive. So this is a, signific a significator method of drawing the card and it I'm sure will also be familiar to many of you. And that is to simply go through the deck one card at a time until I find the high priestess um, and rather than, well, I'll just do it like this. Sun. So one card at a time. And it's a little bit hard because I'm doing it in the mirror that is the video camera. There it is, okay. So, and I'm going to take the card that was before it as my above card, and that was Temperance. And the card below it, immediately below it, Strength! Cool! <laughs> All right. Woof! That's a powerful spread. So what is manifest, I, you know, in this slide, I think of Temperance as a card of, dip, of discipline, of, of blending, of working with... Uh, competing impulses of finding the middle, the middle way, um, which is an active process of ebb and flow. So temperance has often been for me a card that I associate with spiritual practice, right? And the discipline of spiritual practice. And like, you know, this is a four card, it's 10 plus four. Um, like every four card, um, there is this element in temperance that is about finding stability, finding solidity. Um, there's also this long time association of the, of temperance with, uh, the, with a triangle. It's, there's a triangle on the breastplate of the angel in the Waitsmith imagery. Um, I'm not sure about the origin of that. I mean, I don't know if it has to do with, with, um, fire. I tend to think it does. Um, so it may have to do with the elemental association of the temperance card um, and it's, uh, you know, astrological significance. But for me, it also is um, this reminder of the ways in which uh, temperance is about a kind of, like all threes, is about a, a blending of opposite forces. So 
what underlies that. And it is the deep, deep willingness for vulnerability that is at the heart of the tarot's understanding of this virtue, this virtue of strength and fortitude. So underneath that, that discipline, that ability to blend and combine that kind of alchemical capacity to work with a world of discord and find the concord in it, at the basis of that, what is in the depths, what is in the deeps, what is sort of a mystery. It's the mystery of vulnerability. So this kind of resonates a little bit with the sense that loss, um, the five of cups, that achy, breaky heart is the mystery in my earlier version of this poll. Uh, but in this version of the poll, the emphasis being given here is on uh, that strength that comes out of vulnerability. A reminder that the mystery here of, of the achy, breaky human heart, the mystery is also the source of huge strength. It's the source of strength. It's the, the cur, the heart of courage. There it is in our vulnerability, our lion heart. Okay, um, so two different ways to do a two-card poll, right? Uh, a definition of a two-card poll in terms of the papist or high priestess and the sense of mystery and otherness, that, that hiddenness that is always underneath. Um, and then a reminder about spread itself and that our spreads, as we devise them or as we come to know our way with a few spreads that become our go-to spreads, um, that we should always be carrying in our minds, in our hearts, in our tarot practice, everything that we know about number, thanks to the tarot itself. Okay, I hope that made sense and was of some use. And uh, as always, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for your practice with me. Thank you for your practice on your own. Hey, just thank you for your practice. <laughs> Take care, everyone.